Next up, we have a very popular speaker as always, Jeff Houston, who's going to be kicking the tires of the DNS. Thanks for that. Good morning. Um, this is actually a follow-on to Ed's talk because it's trying to actually look at one specific part of this issue around rolling keys. I actually looked and dug up some of this stuff from five years ago and, you know, the announcements that came up. I remember coming to write meetings where all of you were standing up applauding a letter going, we must tell ICANN to sign the route. And it was with great fanfare that, you know, it all happened. Um, and they took it very, very seriously, as you're well aware. And here's a picture of where one of the KSKs evidently lives in some deep, dark repository inside Culpeper in, in Virginia, I assume. Um, you didn't know, but I can inform you, there is a, another KSK uh, here in Amsterdam, uh, just outside the ripe offices somewhere. Um, <laughs> but the commitment was made five years ago, and you know the, the key will roll now. And, you know, there's no reason not to per se. I mean, like, we're not any wiser or any dumber, and the commitment was made to roll it. Why? Keys aren't eternal. No key is eternal. At some point, you have to roll. And there's this large discussion about whether you roll today, tomorrow, or a fortnight's time, or whatever. But what you can't say with confidence is, never roll it. And so, to some point, you know, five years, fair enough, five years. So this is really, really easy, right? Um, you all change keys, you do it all the time. You, know, you publish a new KSK, including DNS key responses, use the new KSK to sign the ZSK, withdraw the old signature and revoke the old KSK, yeah? Fine, you use 5011, everyone's just happy, yes? And here's a diagram to show that it's got lots of pretty colours and we understand it. Sort of. There is some fine detail inside all that phase because two keys are rolling. Every 90 days, the zone signing key already rolls. But it doesn't sort of matter as much. You don't notice it because the key signing key is always constant. So your validators, because they've basically got a static key signing key, simply run with the new zone signing key and everything's changed, and that's fine. But inside this is one really critical little point that assuming you know, we're running with this zone signing key, we're starting to sign and publish with two key signing keys. And just for a critical period where we're running both, the response sizes start to get big. Um, if we're using a 1024-bit zone signing key, it's um, 1,297 octets in response when you do an in DNS key query and if we're using a 2048-bit ZSK, because they have to get bigger sooner or later, it gets to 1425, uh, which the V6 folk would recognise as being interesting. It's certainly over 1280. So, you know, all this is easy, right? And, you know, we've had so much experience before, haven't we? What could possibly go wrong? Um, <laughs> We saw roll over and die, and what was going on there was that every time, every six months, when the RIPE NCC changed their key, this is before the root got signed, so we're using the old DLV ideas, there were some distributions out there that were copying the old key. And as soon as they failed to validate, they started thrashing through name servers. When we noticed this, new software came out. And if you now look at the way most resolvers validate, if they find I can't validate through one name server chain, most of them just give up. Because trying every last name server chain from the root down to the terminal just simply thrashes the DNS. So we don't do that anymore. And of course now we all support RFC 5011 old signs new, don't we? And everyone can cope with absolutely massive DNS responses because you, know, you all just can, can't you? And so if all that's happening, all this will go just absolutely without a hitch. No one will really notice, and it's just going to be wonderful, right? Well, it's not, and you know it, and I know it, that, you know, there's an awful lot of weird stuff out there. And there are kind of two concerns that I can sort of pinpoint as being concerns. Um, we change the key signing key, and you don't pick it up. There are many reasons why you might not pick it up. If you've got RFC 5011 compliant, old signs new, you will pick it up, but maybe you don't have that. 
Maybe you have an implementation that looks for CDS records but doesn't have 5011. Okay, um, but maybe you have none of that. So the first problem is you may not pick it up. And the second problem which was always there is that in the same way that a V6 host is required and routers not to fragment anything smaller, sorry, anything required not to fragment anything smaller than 1280, a standards compliant V4 host is not required to accept the datagram, an IP datagram, larger than 576 octets. Truly, really. And <laughs> nothing is that small anymore. And so the second real concern is when we start to blow these things up in size, you might not believe the answer. You might not be able to get the answer. Now, the first one is really hard to test from the outside. It's kind of, it's your resolver. I can't see what it does with 5011. And there's no way I can test it. You can test it individually for your resolvers, but I can't test it. But oddly enough, the second one can be tested. And that's what I want to talk about this morning very quickly. Do you get bigger responses? So I'm really interested in getting you as users, millions of you, to ask a question where the response is big. In fact, just at that magic size being contemplated in a KSK role. And I want to know if you get the answer or you start thrashing. So here's some interesting sizes and you sort of look at that magic one. It's 1,425 octets, which is that larger size of a DNS key response with a 2048-bit uh, ZSK. There are some other ones out there. I find all this really weird. Most folk understand it and there are a few who just numbers confuse them. The number of folk who set an EDNS zero buffer size of 1,500. It's kind of, do you think the IP top, the, pa the packet header, is zero bytes? You know, the largest DNS payload of an unfragmented Ethernet in DNS is 1452 if you're using V6. If you want a safe EDNS zero size, it should be 1452 if you're dual stacked, 1472 if you're not. Why are you telling me 1500? What's wrong with you? And in fact, if you have a look at EDNS zero buffer sizes, here's the distribution in a cumulative sense. Almost everyone gets what they got from the package and just installs it. The package says 4096, the implementation say 4096. But there's a few with really, really low values. Let's blow them up a bit. Around about 5% come in at 512. Okay. A few come in at around 1410, 1430, 1440, 1460. 1472, and like I said, there are a few that bring in sizes of 1500. God knows what they were thinking. Numbers must confuse them. So the ones we're really interested in are the folk who say, don't send me a response if the response you're going to send me is 1425 bytes or longer, because that's what we're planning to do, which means necessarily the response you get from the root zone is going to be truncated which means necessarily, if you really want the answer, you're going to flick to TCP. Two things, the root zones will get slightly more TCP traffic during this transition, and B, you better be able to receive TCP. All DNS resolvers can talk TCP, can't they? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so, what do we do? Thanks to Google, um, we start measuring from the edge in big volume. We set up the ad, the ad does experiments, the experiments are basically DNS fetches, they all come to servers. So we can do a lot of these. So what we did, 1440 octets, and just to actually ask that protocol question, one was signed with ECDSA, one was signed with RSA. We want to see what you're able to do. So firstly, what do we find? Uh, we did this test 76 million times. Google's amazing. Google is truly amazing. Set this ad out to millions of people. Absolutely. Um, so we did. Um, 76 million queries. Almost everyone sets EDNS zero. Give me back SIGs. Now this is weird because only 30% of you then go through with validation. So oddly enough, if you sign your domain, almost everybody, 83% of queries will get the signatures. 
It sounded this weird, I don't know how to describe it really. You're sort of halfway there. You get back all the hard work and then you go, oh, I'm not going to bother about validating it, which I find quite bizarre. Um, so okay, 83% of you ask for the SIGs. If I look just at resolvers, not queries, um, 1,990 resolvers serve about 93% of the world's 3 billion users. And so when I say we found 777,000 resolvers, we found the 2,000 that really matter. And we found a whole lot more that seem to be your personal resolver, which are just serving one or two people, because that's the way the DNS works. 84% uh, of resolvers ask for all the SIGs. So how well do we work with 1,440 octets? 9,113,000 tests, 85% received the DNS, fetched the web blot, and we're just happy people. So most of you think RSA signed, 1440, just happy. Of that 7.5 million, 2.6 million fetched the DS record. You did the next step. You got the SIGs and you go, do I like what I'm seeing? Let's go and fetch the DS record. Let's start the validation dance. Um, there's a lot of attention deficit disorder in ads, uh, and let me say right now, if you receive an ad on your screen, watch it to the end. Don't stop, okay, just don't stop, because you, you muck up the numbers. So <laughs> watch every ad to the end. Uh, and what we found there was 850,000 of you left early, naughty people, um, and another 494,000 timed out. But I can only actually find a tiny number, 72 folk, who really, really were stranded and didn't sort of do anything that was logical. So out of nine million or so, um, that's awfully small, and that's certainly for me down an experimental error. So 5% of experiments didn't run to completion, okay. And don't forget, I'm measuring users, not resolvers. The resolver damage might be a bit bigger, but you normally have two or three resolvers in your etc. resolve.conf. If one of them fails, you just move on. So I'm measuring users here, not resolvers. Um, then I thought, well, hell, 1440, 1700, what's the difference between friends? Um, so I tried you all with a 1700 octet response. And interestingly, it was still pretty good. The failure rate uh, out of six and a half million experiments that just sort of did both sizes was still pretty small. 5,000 folk just got left stranded. So most of you handle some form of FRAG and TCP failover without any real problem, but the stranding rate's just a little bit higher, just that little bit higher at 5,000. And the next question is ECDSA. Um, there's been some concerns over that, both in terms of intellectual property and whether the NSA pre-cracked it and all that kind of stuff. But there is one thing about these curves. They are cryptographically dense. I've been told, and I have no idea about cryptography, it's all just bits to me, that you get around 10 times the cryptographic strength for the same key length. Or in other words, you can do the same cryptography as 204-bit RSA as you can in, say, 256-bit ECDSA. If you want to know any more, talk to someone who knows what they're talking about, don't talk to me. Um, but what if I compare ECDSA to RSA, and just to be fair, I will pat out the ECDSA response to make sure that both responses are the same size. So the only difference now is the signing protocol. What's the failure rate there? Slightly worse, but not too bad. It's much the same as a really, really big packet. Nine million tests, around 5,000 seem to sort of fail with ECDSA. It's bigger than RSA, it is bigger. But, you know, it's still very, very small. So from ECDSA's point of view, it's viable. The one problem is that one in five of the folk who use resolvers that know about RSA are using old OpenSSL libraries, like level three. And when they get a response signed in ECDSA, they throw up their hands and say, it's not signed. I will treat it as an unsigned name and just press on. So while the response rate is pretty good, the problem is that amongst those pool who received the web blot, they weren't validating, whereas previously in RSA they were. So there's a certain amount of security downgrade happening. There's been a lot of work in browser land, 
prefer V6 goes the message, it's good for you. V6 is better than V4, it's really, really good for you. If you've got dual stack, prefer V6. You guys are in this kind of inverted dystopian land where all the messages are reversed because this is the DNS. So you forget all that crap and you kind of go, if it's V4, I'll use it. If it's V6, I'll ignore it. It's amazing when I look at this that the number of queries in V6 is less than 1%. And I've been playing with that a bit because I'm fascinated by this. Where's the piece of code that goes, well, if I get back an NS record with both 4 and 6, I obviously prefer 4. Why? Um, very small number of resolvers, very small number of queries. If I give you an NS that's 6 only, more than half of you go there. So it's something about resolver preferences that go, don't like six in the DNS. So everyone over there in that next room who's talking about a six only internet next year, next month, next whatever, should talk to the people in this room who are going, no, it's never going to happen. <laughs> Absolutely never going to happen. V4 forever. So it is rather bizarre. Um, V6 has just kind of died in the DNS and I don't understand. Um, so some quick observations, uh, let's give you some time. Um, 87% have DNSSEC OK, which is pretty amazing. And 30% of all DNSSEC resolvers attempt to validate. So if someone tells you there's a real problem with DNSSEC, it's not deployed, they might be talking about people who sign domains, and I don't know because no one lets me walk their domains. But you guys who validate, there's an awful lot of you. The people next door would kill for 25% deployment. And you're just sitting on it going, oh, it's not good enough. Oh, bloody hell, it's more than good enough. It's amazing. So, yes, um, DNSSEC is out there and it's working. There's very little V6. I've gone through that. I don't know why. Browsers prefer 6. The DNS is back there with the horse and buggy and it prefers 4. You're just there. Uh, and ECDSA, as I said, is sort of viable. Sort of because we've left 20% of the folk behind us. If we can pick that up, life would be even better. Can it work? I don't know about 5011. I don't know about any of picking up the key, but using RSA and keeping yourself just below 1500, most of us will get there most of the time. Some resolvers might get stuck, but users normally have two or three resolvers in etc. resolve.com. Users will appear to get there, at least from the size and RSA perspective. And that's all I had. Questions? Any questions for Jeff? Alan. Yeah. Alan Jerome. Uh, I have a question about this IPv6 people who are querying or not querying actually. Do you think it's a side effect of the IP highball algorithm where you try both four and six and if it's faster in four you go four instead of six? Or do you think it's hard coded in the software? My server, in fact it's all just me and my server. There's no difference in round trip times and I don't see any exploratory round trip probing. I actually think it's hard coded, but you know, I don't write DNS code because I'm not kinky enough. Because the folk who write DNS resolvers appear to have a different brain space from the rest of humanity, and I find their code really hard to read. <laughs> hint, hint. Um, <laughs> so I, I can't find any kind of actual rule in the codes that I've looked at. But the, the behaviour seems to indicate there's a solid preference going on. A's before quad A's. Mm -hmm. As you were mentioning, there are only very few resolver that a lot of people are using. Have you been asking those people what they were doing? Uh, no, not yet, but you know, if some of you want to fess up, there are some resolver writers here, fess up. What do you prefer if you get both? Four. Thank you, there's one with V4. I'm not surprised. Thank you. Jared? Uh, Jared March, NTT. Hi. So uh, I, I was gonna comment on the same thing uh, about the V4 versus V6. It's actually, if they were doing RTT probing, there's a number of networks I know that have discovered that uh, because there's no traffic engineering in IPv6, uh, in, in many cases, their IPv6 actually takes the shortest path across their network, whereas the V4 may use traffic engineering and go a slightly longer path. So if they were RTT probing, they would actually prefer V6. But I, I do suspect that there is uh, something a bit simpler to be explained, which is that similar to the probing, 
I suspect that they're going and saying, I have an answer for this V4 thing, but I don't have an answer from the V6 server. And that is probably the most likely case, and they say this is undefined, and therefore I'm just preferring the one I have a cache for. I, you know, I can, I can offer, too, another explanation about this, and I'll be nice to them, uh, the resolver writers. Um, and it came up in DNS OARC uh, from Power DNS's distributed DNS load balancer. And the comment was, DNS resolvers like to run hot. So if I've got five resolvers and I'm load balancing, the comment was, it's better to run three red hot and two idle than all five semi because of caching. Caching works when you hit it hard. And so if I'm sort of V4 and V6, if I do everything in four, Theoretically, the four caches or whatever, you know, all those lines are being filled and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that it sort of seems a safe thing to do and we're all very scared about IPv6 path MTU. We're all very scared about those issues. If we just run four, we're on known ground. So I can understand it to some extent, but I'm, I don't run a CGN and I'm not trying to provision binding capacity with v4 DDoS in the DNS. So I don't live the nightmare of the service provider who's sitting there thinking, no matter how much 6i deploy, as long as I get all this v4 UDP traffic, my CGN still has to be provisioned like crazy, and nothing I can do in 6 makes life better. You guys aren't talking to each other, and selectively making your life better makes their life hell. And this is kind of weird, but it's typical of the internet, and I've ranted too long. Your question. Marek. Marek, the kinky guy from CZN. Um, actually, have you tried to change the order of the records in the glue? The glue records are like carrot on the stick for the resolvers. Um, what I really tried was actually just give everyone V6 only and see wh how you do then, and that's the next thing I'm going to report on at some future meeting. Um, I have mucked around with order in previous experiments. There seems to be a hard V4 ordering. It, it just is hardwired as far as I can tell. Yeah, it's true that some resolvers are unless they can unless they were configured differently, they just fetch the v4 address first. I think they do just fetch yeah. the v4 address first a lot of the time. Yeah. But yeah. if not, does it differently? Tell us. Uh, we just fetch both and then decide based on the round trip time. We can test this. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeff. Okay, then that brings us to any other business. And as far as I know, there's only one item which I'll cover very briefly.